Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our Black and, Black and Brown Maternal Health Summit um, here um, at the UP Center. And so this summit is presented presented to you by um, the UP Center's Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. Our program um, consists of two home visiting models, Healthy Families and Parents as Teachers, which is also known as PAT. And both of our programs strive to bring awareness to child development, strengthening parenting relationships, and health-related topics such as prenatal care, postpartum care, and mental health awareness. My name is Jessica Simmons, and I am a Family Resource Specialist with Healthy Families Norfolk. So this morning, our goal is to have a conversation surrounding the disparities that many black and brown girls and women face around the world. Unfortunately, this is not just an issue in Virginia, but women all over the US have reported being treated harshly in the delivery room, neglected and uneducated on their rights and policies. According to the CDC, Black, American, Indian, and Alaska Native women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women, and this disparity increases with age. Black women are much more likely to receive no prenatal care or to receive it later than the first trimester than women of any race besides American, Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian. Access to adequate prenatal care has um, benefits to both mother and baby. Black women are more likely to suffer from hypertension and preeclampsia, which increase the chances of adverse health outcomes for mothers and babies. So while this is a growing trend, many people are uncomfortable addressing the issue and having conversations to educate the community and to advocate for those experiencing it. Thank you so much for joining us this morning to contribute to the work of advocacy and education to raise awareness of the disparities surrounding our community and bringing about positive and effective change. So a few uh, housekeeping rules or things, um, please utilize the chat feature for all questions for our presenters. And there will also be a short survey at the end of the summit today and your participation will be greatly appreciated. So our first presenter um, this morning is Dr. Leslie Farrington. Dr. Leslie Farrington is a retired African-American obstetrician gynecologist from New York City with her MD from Howard University College of Medicine. Leslie has a unique perspective on racism and medicine having grown up in an interracial family during the civil rights era. As a black woman physician, Leslie knows the mortality statistics are the tip of the iceberg of preventable harm experienced in the Black community due to racism in medicine and society. After retirement, she developed the ACTT curriculum which technique, with techniques and tools which expectant and new mothers, along with their supporters, can use to obtain centered care with dignity. ACTT is a powerful, self-affirming, and potentially life-saving reminder to A, ask questions until you understand the answers, C, claim your space, physical and mental, T, trust your body, and T, tell your story. July 2020, in partnership with birth justice activists and community members, Leslie established Black Coalition for Safe Motherhood. BCFSM to spread ACTT and promote healthcare advocacy and holistic support to birthing families in the Black community nationwide. So this morning, I present to you all our very first presenter, Dr. Leslie Farrington. Thank you for having me. I'm retired now, and I can see as a retired obstetrician how obstetric violence seems normal to doctors and nurses who work on labor and delivery. As a Black woman who appears to be white because um, from an interracial marriage, I was a unique witness to how racism shows up in maternity care. And I welcome this opportunity 
to explore this topic with you all today. Birth trauma due to obstetric violence. I'm a co-founder of the Black Coalition for Safe Motherhood, and we'll see later how uh, my program can help alleviate this problem. So today we're going to define and describe birth trauma and obstetric violence, explain how they occur, what we can do to prevent obstetric violence and how to heal after the trauma of birth with obstetric violence. A brief definition is distress experienced by a mother during or after birth. It can be physical due to severe complications of the birth, but it is often emotional or psychological and has a lasting impact in many women. The events or care which cause the distress, that is birth trauma, they are related to physical threat, violation, violation of bodily autonomy or injury, which is related to complications. The feelings experienced by those who report their birth as traumatic are fear, helplessness, and horror. And reports are ranged between 9 and 45% of births are considered traumatic by the birthing person. Now, obstetric violence which causes at least 60% of the uh, traumatic births is mistreatment by medical personnel during labor or birth. It is a common cause, at least 60% of a traumatic birth experience. Someone can have a serious medical or surgical complication of birth and not consider it traumatic if they are supported emotionally and physically by staff and family. Obstetric violence ranges from disrespect to physical assault. Verbal abuse is obstetric violence. Joking, medical staff joking about the pain a woman is going through or having to change into a uh, flimsy gown, and other um, situations which staff may belittle by making fun of it. Paternalistic attitudes result in abuse when a person is told, a grown person is told what they are allowed or not allowed to do. Ignoring a birth plan or ignoring patients' preferences is a form of disrespect. Dismissing patient reports of pain, chest pain, abdominal pain, labor pain, or other symptoms like shortness of breath. This is not only uh, neglectful, but it is dangerous. And of course, racial microaggressions happen all the time. Coercion is very common. Staff, including doctors and nurses, often give biased information or outright lies they say to the uh, birthing person in order to get them to do what they want them to do. They threaten that harm may come to the mother or the baby, saying things like, you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt the baby by choosing this or choosing that. Sometimes they'll threaten to call Child Protective Services. Fear and shame to control birthing families is a very common issue. Lack of informed consent when uh, going ahead with procedures is a form of obstetric violence. 
coming into the labor room and just pulling a person's legs open and saying, let's see how you're doing is a procedure without consent. Stripping membranes during a vaginal exam or breaking the bag of waters without explaining what's happening is a form of obstetric violence. Episiotomy or forceps or vacuum assisted instrumental deliveries without discussing these procedures in advance is obstetric violence. Physical restraint, forced procedures. These can feel like rape and sexual abuse, which many women have experienced in, uh, before coming in to the birthing situation. All of this is assault and battery and would not be tolerated in any other situation. Obstetric violence is when a healthcare provider ignores a laboring person's questions, doesn't ask before touching her. Uh, speaking to the white doula instead of the black patient. The uh, birth monopoly group tells us to call it out, name it, don't normalize obstetric violence. In the Giving Voice to Mothers study, 2,700 US women were surveyed. One in six reported mistreatment giving birth. Most of the people in the study were white, but 27% of women of color of low socioeconomic status reported mistreatment. But even interviewing all, all women, all groups, one in six reported mistreatment. So this is a problem for women overall. But black women, women of color, were twice as likely as white women to report that a healthcare provider ignored them, refused their request for help, failed to respond to their request for help in a reasonable amount of time. And everyone can see how this can be very dangerous. Disrespect, degradation, assault at birth, these can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. And it does in about 3% of pregnancies. Postpartum depression or anxiety can result. Previous trauma, as I said, increases the risk. If there's a disagreement with medical personnel, there's a higher chance of mistreatment. All of this impacts infant health, and long-term health of the mother. Why is this happening? One only needs to look at the history of obstetrics. Obstetrics was de developed uh, by experimenting on enslaved Black women. Women, and especially Black women, were not valued by society, as full human beings. So it's, it's understandable that we have obstetric violence today. Birth was taken over by doctors from traditional African-American midwives. They were able to capitalize on the uh, birthing, the pathologizing of birth, telling women that birth was dangerous and that midwives were dirty and it was safer to deliver, to give birth in the hospital. The miseducation of doctors and nurses continues today. Birth is not considered to be a normal process and midwives are often felt to be uh, less than or uh, not the optimal people to um, attend a birth. And that's not true in every other country. Every other country, the majority of births are attended by midwives. And in the United States, 90% of births are attended by physicians. And we can see from the history 
that this has not been, and the present, that this has not been beneficial in this country where birth outcomes are far worse than all the other well-resourced countries. Part of the problem is a culture of disrespect in medicine, which was written about by Dr. Lucien Leap. He says disrespectful behavior threatens patient safety in multiple ways, and dismissive treatment of patients impairs communication and the patient's engagement as partners in safe care. In the study of 2,200 women in uh, the Netherlands who reported traumatic births, women attributed the cause of their traumatic birth experience primarily to lack of or loss of control and issues of communication and practical emotional support. These women believe that in many cases, their trauma could have been reduced or prevented by better communication and support by their caregiver. Here are some ways that we can uh, prevent obstetric violence. Check out the maternity services early, even before getting pregnant, if possible. Learn about pregnancy and birth. If everyone who is of childbearing years and their support team understand what uh, is possible and they make a plan based on what is the birthing person prefers and values, and if they choose a black midwife or a black doctor with whom uh, good communication is possible, then the chances of avoiding obstetric violence is much greater. Consider a community birth versus a hospital birth. That means a birth in a birthing center or at home. There is much less uh, mistreatment in the community settings. Knowing your rights is, is, is important. It is so much more important to know about what you want, and then you can assert your rights. Bringing a doula or a well-informed partner or advocate is another way of reducing the chances of being a, a victim of obstetric violence. Learn about the policies in the hospital and the names of the people in charge. Get the names of the titles, the names and titles of the staff that comes into the labor room. And in the, in the labor room, post a, a bill of rights that comes from that institution. Post the birth plan. Give out copies of the birth plan. And very importantly, give and expect respect and empathy. If not, switch nurse or switch the doctor. Maternal health and human rights. This is a summary. Everyone has the human right to respectful, safe, quality care. Everyone has the right to ask questions and get the information they need to make informed decisions about their health. Everyone has the legal right to informed consent before agreeing to or refusing any test or, or procedure. And childbearing does not limit rights to bodily autonomy, dignity, and self-determination. The pregnant person is the decision maker for her baby. Let's get into informed consent in more detail. It should be a conversation based on the best medical evidence. It is a legal right to be informed about any recommended treatment or operation or procedure. The nature of this, of this procedure, the risks and benefits, and the alternatives, including the risks and benefits of alternative procedures, including possibly doing nothing. This is a conversation, not a form. Again, informed consent is not a form that you sign. The, the signing of the form signifies that the conversation was had and that the patient's questions have been answered. 
in pregnancy, there is still autonomy, bodily autonomy. And pregnancy does not limit the requirement to get informed consent and to honor a pregnant woman's right of refusal of recommended treatment. And this is from the Ethics Committee of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So a, a pregnant woman is entitled to refuse any procedure regardless of the reasons given for undergoing that procedure. My organization promotes the ACT for Safe Motherhood curriculum. The acronym stands for ask questions until you understand the answers, claim your space, both physical and mental, trust your body, and tell your story. Claiming your space means your physical bodily autonomy and your mental, your self-determination. When you disagree with your doctor, do you say, I disagree? Or, Doc, I prefer another option. If you're reluctant to speak up, what do you feel comfortable saying or doing? It's important to practice what's possible for you to be ready for those difficult conversations if they occur. Things you can say are, I need some more information to make a decision. I'd like some time to talk to my partner or my doula. I respectfully decline. No, no, thank you. I just don't want to have that done to my body. You can say, oh, we'll get a second opinion from the doctor in charge of labor and delivery. And you can name that person as long as you learn that name ahead of time. You can even show them a copy of their patient's bill of rights. And you can ask them to see the ethics statement on your right of refusal, which comes from their organization. The Birth Monopoly Group has these uh, handouts and uh, about communication in the hospital. And they advise practice, 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 just as I mentioned, practice speaking up, practice uh, with your partner or your doula, how to say no how to say, give us some time to decide. And I like this bottom section, set the tone with love and humanity. Bring in some treats for the, for the staff and how can they uh, get an attitude? Make it clear that you're on the same team and you give respect and expect it. If the situation becomes urgent or you're not being heard, and this comes from the Know Your Rights course, um, which is a course that um, is cost uh, at least $100, but it's well worth it if you are being an advocate for someone. This gives you some ideas of what to say when the situation becomes uh, escalated. See the documents, please document in the medical record that you intend to force me to have an intervention. Uh, I do not consent. May we see that policy in writing, et cetera. Now, suppose a birth is traumatic and it involves obstetric violence. There's rarely uh, benefits from uh, a lawsuit. A lawsuit takes a long time. And unless there's severe physical injury, it usually does not get results. It is important to get support, however, get ther have therapy, medical treatment if necessary for severe anxiety or depression. It's important to let people know that this happened, complain to the CEO of the hospital, to the Department of Health, to the state medical board, speak to the advisory council of the hospital if they have one, a patient advisory council. Write reviews, including on the Earth app. The Earth app is where Black women can leave and find reviews, just like Yelp. And if you can keep good records of what has happened, even videotape or audio record what has happened, it can be 
submitted on social media. We want to affect the reputations of the places that are disrespectful of their patients. I mentioned support. Uh, support before, during, and after birth is really key for healing the trauma that uh, women often come to pregnancy with. So we want to encourage moms, shield them from disrespect and abuse, shield them from discrimination, comfort them, make sure they're comfortable, make sure they're getting good nourishment throughout the pregnancy. Sometimes it's not easy to be um, uh, pregnant in this day and age and to get access to good food. Support improves outcomes. All of these things improve outcomes for moms and babies. So we encourage moms in our ACT curriculum. We encourage moms to gather a support team and we encourage community members and family to be on a, a mom's team. Supporters can help mom get medical attention, especially after the birth, where majority of, of complications can occur and when mom is focused on the baby and not herself. So holistic support is really important for improving Black maternal health. Finally, those who are caring for birthing people, nurses, doctors, midwives, they can be aware of trauma, previous trauma that moms have been through, and they can optimize care with trauma-informed care in a way that affords survivors of trauma a sense of safety and control. I thank you for your patience, your time, and I look forward to your answers, your questions and answer, at the question and answer period. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to have the task to introduce this next presenter. I am elated to introduce her to you this morning. I have watched this young woman grow and become a beautiful wife, nurturing and engaging mother, as well as a passionate and dedicated professional. Deborah Carlos is a certified bird doula. Currently, she works for the UP Center as a bird doula support and child bird educator, providing services to families in Hampton Roads. Her childbirth education classes cover stages of labor, medical intervention, cesarean, and much more. The doula support covers prenatal support, labor and delivery support, and postpartum support. She loves helping expecting families achieve their birth goals. I introduce you to Deborah Carlos. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Um, as Ms. Adams stated, my name is Deborah Carlos, and I am the certified birth doula um, at the UP Center, and I'm also the childbirth educator. Um, a lot of times uh, when I tell people what I do for a living, they're like, well, what? Well, what is a doula anyway? <laughs> And simply put, a doula is a trained professional that provides educational, emotional, and physical support to a birthing person and their families as well. Or some people call us a birth coach. Um, many may not know that there are several different types of doulas. You have your antepartum doula, and those doulas support you from the beginning of your pregnancy and all the way up until birth. Then you have me, your birth doula, I typically come in around uh, your third trimester and um, I do continuous labor and delivery support. And then I follow up with some postpartum visits. Then you have your postpartum doulas who help you transition into parenthood. Or if you already have some children, um, they help you get um, accustomed to your new routine um, with the newborn and help your family as well. And then you have your end of life and your bereavement doulas who are there to support you in case of a loss. 
So what does some of this doula support look like? As stated, like I stated before, we, we do educational, physical, and emotional support. So some of that informational support comes in as keeping the families and the birthing person informed of evidence-based birth. We wanna keep them updated on all of their um, local resources and all the information um, that they need to know about pregnancy and birth and postpartum um, recovery. Um, some more informational support um, suggests techniques in labor, such as breathing techniques, relaxing techniques, movement, and positioning. Those are our comfort measures that we go over um, during our prenatal visits. And help explain medical procedures before or as they occur. So um, while we're in the hospital, or if we're having a birth center birth or home birth, we want to make sure they understand what's happening as it's happening or before it happens so they can take the time to um, make an informed decision um, as far as how they want their pregnant, their labor to go. We also help the partner um, understand what's going on with their loved one's labor because a lot of times people don't like to see their loved ones in distress. Um, so we wanna help keep them grounded um, and keep them um, knowledgeable of what's going on. We're gonna physical support. A lot of our hands-on work comes in um, during labor and delivery. Although during our prenatal visits, we do do a little bit of physical support as far as comfort measures goes, but a lot of, again, the hands-on comes in during labor and delivery. We do with the touch of, um, through massage, we use counter pressure, the use of rebozo. We want to help create a calm environment, like dimming the lights and arranging curtains, um, especially in the hospital setting. Sometimes that can make people anxious. Um, a lot of people are opting for home births, and still, we see if you see the pictures, are so beautiful with the fairy lights and the dim curtains and the calm room. We just want to make sure the environment is as calm as um, possible. Um, we assist with the water therapy, with the use of the shower if you're in the tub or um, the birthing pool, we call those your aquadurals because that does help um, with contractions. Um, we use of um, warm, warm cloth or cold cloth with a heating pad or rice socks or um, anything of that nature. We assist the birthing person in, the, in and out of the room, walking to and from up the hallways, walking around the room. Well, during the COVID space in the hospital, some hospitals are having um, our patients stay in the room. So we walk around that room and um, we provide nourishment as ice chip water and, and food, um, food. So emotional support. We all know our pregnant, <laughs> while we're pregnant, our pregnant families, um, our emotions can range from happy, sad, anger, confused, but we want to make sure we are that continuous presence again to keep them grounded. We want to provide that reassurance, that encouragement, and that praise to help them keep going. Um, we want to help them see their, themselves or their situation a little bit more positively, because when we go over a birth plan, we might have um, our plan is one way, and sometimes things can go another way, and we want to make sure that we're um, keeping them a little more positive um, outlook on what's going on. Keeping company. And when I talk about keeping company, I wanna um, express that I'm there for their family as well, their partner, whoever their partners may be, their mom, their dad, their husband, their spouse, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, whoever is there um, supporting them on the supporting team, we keep them um, company as well. We wanna show a caring attitude. Um, keeping a proper bedside manner to keep those families um, encouraged. And debriefing after birth. After everything is over, we have our nice um, baby and everybody is starting to calm down. The, everybody, the room is clearing out. The mother typically voices her concerns or talks about how well everything went. And we just wanna be there. Again, be that continuous presence, that listening ear and um, listening with, to the mother and the family um, with empathy. At the Up Center, um, I provide prenatal visits, labor and delivery um, support, and postpartum visits. So during our prenatal visits, we talk about the use of comfort measures. Um, we go over them in detail, and we probably we practice them as well. We go over our um, what goes in the birth bag. We talk about um, a lot of things that go into um, um, childbirth education classes you get in my prenatal visits. And the one of the big things that we go over is our birth plan. We talk about... Um, how was your ideal birth? What is your ideal birth? And then we go over, um, you have your plan A, plan B, and then our plan C. So if our mom is saying, I wanna have an unmedicated birth. Okay, cool. So while we're in labor, what happens if your, unmed your plan to have an unmedicated birth and you're like, okay, my code word is cookies. I can't take these contractions anymore. 
um, I want an epidural. What are some steps we can take before we get to the epidural? So that's our plan B and then our plan C. So we wanna make sure we go into detail um, so our families can understand their options. And I also talk about taking their birth plan to their prenatal visits with their, um, their healthcare provider. So you can see if maybe they don't have wireless monitoring at this hospital. Um, so they can go over their options and what they can and can't do. And then we can come back and revisit that. But our birth, um, our prenatal visits, we go over a wide variety of things. Um, continuous labor and delivery support. Um, I'm there from the time you tell me you have your first contraction <laughs> all the way up into an hour after you have your baby. And then I will give you, um, I'll give you your space for that bonding from you and your family. Um, but I make sure that that baby is uh, there for breast, breastfeeding support if you choose to do so. And then I follow up after with some postpartum visit to make sure you are okay, your baby's okay, and your family is okay as well. We want to make sure they're um, we're not experiencing any symptoms of postpartum depression. We want to make sure your baby is latching properly. And we want to make sure you didn't have any concerns or anything that happened during labor and delivery. Um, my childbirth education classes, I do offer one-on-one -on -one sessions. And I also offer um, group classes. And they can be virtual or in-person. And we go over medical interventions. We talk about cesareans. We talk about the stages of labor. We talk about the ins and out of birth, your different positioning that you can use during pushing or um, during labor. So some of the studies um, that have been proven to, um, for a doula to be present during labor can cut back on time spent in labor. We reduce the mother's anxiety about labor. We lower the rate of medical interventions, the use of forceps, episiotomies, um, and a vacuum. And we also lower the rate of cesarean sections. We improve the mother-baby bonding um, post-birth. Um, we improve the odds of breastfeeding success. And we just increase the overall birthing experience. And the big one is we also help you advocate for yourself. Um, Dr. Farrington touched on a lot of things that hit home for me. Um, I did not have a um, doula present at my labor and I did have a traumatic uh, birth experience, which is why I became a doula. I remember sitting home and thinking like, what can I do to support other women? So they didn't feel the way that I did when I left home, I'm gonna tear up because it's, it just, it really hits home and I really am passionate about um, what I do. If I was able to, if I knew that I could speak up for myself and it wasn't what the doctors told me that I had to do, then my birth experience could have been, um, could have been differently. So I wish I had that extra set of eyes to, um, to be there, excuse me. <clears throat> so advocacy. So if having a doula present, having a doula present there, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if something was happening that you weren't aware about, I can be those eyes to point out and say, hey, this is going on. Do you need a second to think about it? Because we can um, you have your partner ask the doctor to leave and we can talk about it so you can make a better informed decision. A misconception of doulas is that we advocate for you. We teach which is not true. We teach you how to advocate for yourself. We want you to ask those questions, ask those important questions. We go over, again, that's something that we go over in our prenatal visits. We um, give a scenario, again, like Dr. Ferris said, she hit a lot of stuff right on the head with that nail. Um, we want you to ask those questions. We teach you, we give you scenarios so we can say, what if this happens? What do you do in this situation? Do you wanna take a second to think about it or are you okay with it? Um, same thing with their partners. We want to make sure that um, we want to make sure that they're aware as well. So we want to build that strong support team around our our mothers, and we want to make sure that everybody has um, the same views as you. Your doctors, your OB, your nurses, your um, supporting team. We want to make sure they have the same views as you. We want to make sure you know the birth plan, and we just want everybody to have that best your best interest in mind. In mind. So here are some, um, some, some tips that you guys can look over, some facts. Um, like Jess stated before that our black and brown women are two to three times more likely to, to pass away due, due to pregnancy related causes. And a lot of those um, deaths could have been prevented if their, if their um, providers were listening, listening to if they were advocating for themselves. So one of my goals is to help my families advocate for themselves to have a better birth outcome. 
So thank you guys for taking the time to listen to me. My name is Deborah Carlos. And if you guys wish to reach out to me, um, my email is deborah.carlos at theupcenter.org. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I have the pleasure of announcing Heather Wilson. Heather Wilson is a bereaved mother who works with parents faced with pregnancy and infant loss as an executive director and founder of Kennedy's Angel Gowns. This nonprofit organization provides infant burial garments and resources um, to families in local hospitals. Heather believes that every bereaved family deserves the gift of time when faced with this tragic loss. Hospitals need a cooling device that preserves an infant, which allows this precious time for the family to breathe. Heather has secured the first ever butterfly suite in Virginia, a dedicated bereaved space equipped with a caring cradle at Centera Norfolk General Hospital. Heather is a certified bereavement doula and a recipient of the 40 Under 40 Millennial on the Move, Ladies in Red Exceptional Women Award and the Hampton Roads Gazetti Exemplar Award. She's a legacy honorary as well. She has appeared on local news networks and recently her advocacy work has brought her to the White House to speak at the Black Maternal Health Crisis Roundtable led by Vice President Kamala Harris. Heather holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from the American International and a Master's of Arts in Urban Community Counseling from Norfolk State University. Heather is an outreach manager for the Stephen Cohen Military Family Clinic at the Up Center, a professor at Old Dominion University, and a soon-to-be licensed professional counselor. Heather is a wife to Dimitri, um, a mother to Angel Baby Kennedy, Rainbow Baby Riley, and a son a sunshine baby, Dimitri Jr. Good morning. Good morning. Is everyone able to hear me okay? My name is Heather again, and I'm honored to be presenting today. This is obviously a topic that's very close to my heart, and um, I just love to advocate and, and be in a space to share my knowledge and share my experience because stories really drew, really do touch the heart and really do um, bring about change when there's a story behind it. And I have a story to share. So this is my story from pain into passion. My journey to motherhood began in 2009. Um, it was about two years into my, my marriage. My husband and I decided that we wanted to grow our family. Um, we were beyond excited. We were very excited. We planned everything to a T. I'm a planner by trade, so everything was just completely planned out um, for the arrival of our uh, daughter. We found out it was a daughter, and um, we would later name her Kennedy. Um, my pregnancy was honestly, it was beautiful. Um, it was uneventful until about the second or third trimester. I was put on bed rest, um, but um, not full bed rest. I was still working, still trying to do my daily routines, but just not moving around as much. I was diagnosed with preeclampsia in my third trimester. Um, it was discovered with protein in my urine, um, and I was uh, heavily monitored, and, you know, friends and family told me it's okay, it's going to be all right. Even the uh, medical doctors, they kind of just shared with me that it's preeclampsia, we'll just keep monitoring you. Um, at that point, I really didn't, I didn't really realize how big of a deal preeclampsia could be, that it could cost me uh, the life of my child, so um I'm, I'm disappointed in the knowledge and the information that I was shared with regarding the preeclampsia. As we approached the end of my pregnancy, my symptoms grew more and more intense, and they made the decision to deliver Kennedy early. So in my eyes, they're just going to deliver her early and everything's going to be fine. When they made that decision, um, they decided after doing non-stress tests twice a week um, that they would deliver her the following week. Unfortunately, um, with one day to spare, we did not make it to the following week. It was nearing the delivery date that they had planned out, and I didn't feel movement, so uh, my doctor alerted me to go to the hospital. When I arrived to the hospital, there was um, just, I could 
kind of had that mother's instinct that there was just no success in finding, finding her heartbeat. They were stalling me. And what I later realized is they were stalling me so that they could go get a doctor to deliver the information that my daughter had passed away. Um, there are no words to describe what it feels like um, to carry a child full term and to be told there's no heartbeat. There are no words um, for the medical professionals that had to deliver that news, for me and my husband who had to hear that news, my family members who had to hear that news. It is a tragedy all around. Um, and it's one that I work in, I do the work in this now to prevent families from hearing that news because it, it changes your life forever. Um, when we were notified that my daughter's heartbeat um, had stopped, I think in my mind, I was kind of, um, I don't know, I thought she would magically just be delivered. I didn't think about what would happen after they told me that she had passed away that I actually had to deliver her. And so that was the next process. Um, it was hearing the news and then it was getting prepped to then deliver your baby who you knew was deceased. Um, I immediately um, got very, very ill. My, the preeclampsia had ravaged my body. My blood pressure was through the roof and um, they were afraid that I would then have a stroke. So while my daughter had lost her life, I was fighting for my own. Uh, my parents at the time still lived back home in Rhode Island and they drove 10 hours um, to get to me thinking that they would miss the delivery. But unfortunately I was ill and um, labored for 26 hours in pain and um, just unaware of everything that was going on. It was literally my worst nightmare. Um, with my blood pressure so high and um, finding out um, after I delivered her that the reason she passed was that I had placenta abruption, which is common with preeclampsia. And I look back, um, when I look back, I think about um, how I wasn't told about any of these dangers of the complications that could occur or the outcomes that affect um, black women like myself with something that is as serious as preeclampsia. Um, it was August 17th, 2009 that my daughter was born. Um, we named her Kennedy Milan Wilson and she was absolutely perfect. She looked like a sleeping angel. And I will share a picture um, of her at the end of one of my slides, but um, I just wanted to also share, uh, my baby was stillborn and that um, that is common in, with preeclampsia and um, more common at the end of pregnancies as well. To lose every dream, hope that you have for your baby in an instant is, um, something that I would not wish on my, my worst enemy. Um, the, word, the world just kind of stood still in that moment of, of grief. And uh, I just remember the doctor shuffling everyone out of the room and um, just trying to support me, but also support my husband and also deliver her and make sure that I survived as well. It was just, it was, it was scary moments at that time. Um, at the aftermath, we just really struggled to pick up the pieces. We didn't know where to turn. This was in 2009, but there were hardly any resources. And uh, what struck me as, um, as very odd is that this is very common. This is not something that's uncommon. This, is, this affects one in four women. Um, so the fact that there were no resources just really toyed with my husband and my emotions. We just said that there's gotta be something that we can do to support these families. Um, we were working through our grieving process and my recovery process. I ended up staying in the hospital for five additional days because they could not regulate my blood pressure. I had um, my, my husband and my mom had to completely plan my daughter's funeral. I wasn't able to be a part of that because I was still trying to um, heal from the recovery process and the preeclampsia that had ravaged my body. Um, outside of the doors of the hospital, I could hear other families celebrating the joys of their babies that had arrived. And that, again, is something that just tugged on my heart. It was two things that I remember back then. It was that my mom and husband could not find anything to bury her in. 
they, I would call and say, what, what is taking so long? And they would say, there's literally nothing small enough. And I had a five pound baby, which is not really small, but um, I just knew that I had to do something because there's no way someone who delivered a baby that's deceased should have to go into a children's department to look for clothes. Um, so that was one thing I noticed. And the other thing I noticed was it was really hard to hear other people celebrating when my world had collapsed right in front of me. And so um, what we did is we launched a, a nonprofit called Kennedy's Angel Gowns. And there's, there's two main focuses that we do. Um, there's a lot of focuses, but the two main focuses of where it evolved from was creating angel gowns. And so angel gowns are essentially burial gowns. And they are made from uh, donated wedding dresses. So people donate wedding dresses to us, and then we recreate them into burial gowns for families. And I brought some examples. They're absolutely stunning. And um, they're made for little girls and little boys. We have little suits for boys so that families do not have to worry about what they will bury their child in. They are free of charge to families. We bring them right to the hospital. That's kind of how I got involved in being a bereavement doula because our ministry led us right to the bedside of families who had just lost their children. At times when we visited prior to COVID, at times when we visited the hospitals, the families would literally still be holding their babies. And um, although very triggering at times, it is a sense of peace to know that I can be someone who's walked the walk and be right there holding their hands and letting them know that there is hope, that there is resources, that you're not alone, that this affects so many people that, um, that you would be surprised. Um, I think once I start sharing, started to share my story, there were even family members that had happened to and we didn't know about. So um, that was one piece was definitely the, the angel gowns because in my mind, no one should have to go into a baby department and pick out clothes for their baby. Um, and then the second piece was that um, a bereavement suite. So um, at Norfolk General has the first ever um, bereavement suite that we donated. Um, it's, a, it's a space that families can go in to be with their angels and um, they don't have to see the, it's a baby, it's a girl, it's a boy balloons. They can spend that time making memories. A big piece to the um, bereavement suite, we call it the butterfly suite and it's pictured on that, um, on that slide. You can see a portion of the room. We have some gowns hanging in there, but you'll see in that picture, there's a, a device with a teddy bear in it. That's called a cooling unit. That specific one that's in the image is the caring cradle. There are three devices right now. The first one developed was the cuddle cot that was developed out of Europe. And um, then came the, cool, the caring cradle, which is the one pictured. And there's also the Amish cenotaph uh, cradle that is both of those are in the from the United States. Um, I want to share a little bit about the cooling devices in the clip that I'm about to play. It tells you a little bit about um, what what it is and that it's not morbid. It may seem morbid, but when you think about having a, a full term baby that you literally delivered, um, you only have those memories that you make right then in those moments. You only have that time to um, do those, the, the footprints and to hold and take pictures of your baby. So what these devices do is they kind of, they, we like to say they give the gift of time. Um, these devices are able to preserve the baby's body for about five days. Now, we all know the hospital is going to kick you out of the hospital in about two days. But in the time that you are in the hospital, it allows for you to visit with the baby and it stays right in the room with the family. And they're able to create all the memories that they that they need to create to remember this, um, this life loss. So very thankful that um, Amsterdam and um, other organizations are starting to highlight how important it is um, to pay attention to what we're dealing with. I'm going to move right into um, Black maternal health 
and the women, black women and black babies, black and brown babies that are dying. Um, women are not dying because of the diseases. I'm sorry, women are not dying because the diseases cannot be prevented, but because societies have not decided their lives are worth saving. I found this quote and it just really opens up into what we're here to talk about today. If you could go to the next slide. I'm not gonna bore you with statistics, but I'm gonna highlight a couple of really important ones. Black American Indian and Alaska Native women are two to three more likely, more time, two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. Most pregnancy related deaths are preventable. Preventable is the key word. That to me just says everything about why we're here. Um, it's alarming to me um, that the, the length and the, the, the range of the statistics that you can find just from Googling. Um, I was able to meet uh, Linda Villarosa and speak with her about this and her article that she did in the New York Times. And one thing that I found, I, I think out of everything she said was the statistic that shows that an African-American woman with an advanced degree is still has a higher chance of dying than a white woman with an eighth grade education. My mind is just, is just blown. Um, I'm not gonna, again, kill you with the statistics, but I do wanna share some here on this side, but also some on the pregnancy and loss side. Um, another one that we should really discuss and highlight today is uh, mortality and morbidity. And so mortality is obviously the death of a woman when she's delivering her child. But morbidity is the near-death experience. And that was me. I was one who had a near-death experience. And I think, um, Deborah Carlos, that's your situation too. Um, for every woman that we lose, every woman that dies, there are 100 more women that face morbid morbidity. So every woman that's passed, there are 100 more, like myself, like Deb, that fought for their lives and had an, a pregnancy experience that just was not good. If you could go to the next slide. And I've already gone over this one, actually. Can you go to the next one? Sorry. <laughs> These are some facts about stillbirths. Again, I'm in the fight for the, the mamas and the babies. Um, these are some statistics from Star Legacy. They're a great resource. The, they provide free pamphlets. If anyone's interested, you can go right on their website and order them to your hospital, to your home, to your office. Um, one that I want to highlight is um, that stillbirth is still the most understudied issue in medicine today. Although it happens this often, it's not studied. Another one that I want to highlight is one in 160 stillbirths are what we're facing right now. So one in 160 pregnancies end in stillbirth. Um, more babies are stillborn annually than die from prematurity and SIDS combined. And of course, we all know the reason that we're fighting this fight now is because when they've done the studies, they realize that we're 48th out of the 49 developed nations with these issues of mommies and babies not making it. Next slide, please. I'm here for a call to action like most of us on this call are. Um, my call to action came when um, this happened to my family and it took me seven years of grieving and and really finding my voice in all of this um, it led me to be a bereavement doula um, the year after i lost the baby was the hardest year of my life um, you'd think it was right after but it's when it really it's it's about six months in it's all of the um the milestones that my baby would have reached that really just tore my heart to pieces and it launched me to become a bereavement doula my work there has been, um, it's been interesting, but it's allowed me to have a voice. It's allowed me, as mentioned, to make it to the White House to share amongst other hurting women who had stories just as powerful. And um, when I went to the White House, my message was really to just ask for change to be enforced for policies, for funding, because um, a lot of the doulas that work um, 
are doing it for, for pennies if they're even getting paid. Um, it's something that every woman should have. Every woman should be able to have a doula, to be an advocate, to be a voice, to be that person that's right alongside you. Um, it's, it's to create change, is to ensure the safety of black and brown mothers like myself, uh, to make that change through legislation, through healthcare accountability and incentives and rewards. Um, and standards of care, standards of care that should be so basic. We shouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, I'm so honored to have gone to the White House and I'm even more thankful that change happened even that day. Um, at the end of our round table, the President of the United States signed a proclamation within 30 minutes of, of us leaving the White House that initiated Black Maternal Health Week to focus on Black maternal health, to include the initial actions like funding. They set aside $200 million to implement trainings on implicit bias and um, help to provide $340 million to increase the Title X Family Planning Program. This is a reproductive and preventable um, health service program that they've put together. Um, although this is a start, we have a long way to go. Um, for me, every breath in my body, body will be towards this fight for my family. Um, for Kennedy, this is to honor her, to honor her fight and um, to honor all the angel babies and all the moms that we've lost, that, that we lost to a preventable situation, which is just, it's untimely and it's, and it's not okay. And so um, I hope that you'll fight with me. You can um, find me <laughs> fighting um, through Kennedy's Angel Gowns. That's the work that I do with, uh, with the nonprofit, um, with uh, my bereavement doula, I, I never charge any of the families. It's all free services because I, that's the last thing you need to think about um, is the support that you need and should have after a loss. Um, right now we're supporting about 10 families a week. We're helping 10 babies, bury, 10 families bury their children a week, far too many. Um, we started in Hampton Roads, but we've even sent gowns as far as Kenya at this point. Um, I just really, I think it's important to get involved. If I could give any advice to anyone who is pregnant, get yourself a doula, step one. Step two, listen to your body. I promise you, nobody knows your body better than you do. Listen to your body, be your own advocate. If you can't be your own advocate, get someone who can be that voice for you. Call me, I'll be your advocate. Um, it's important that we stick together. It's important that we share these stories. These, these stories are hard to hear, but they are a reality for so many women. And we can't help if we don't share the knowledge, share the, share the power and share the fight. So this is a fight for all of us that we owe to ourselves and uh, especially to these families that have um, experienced loss. Um, as a mother, I hope that my experience can fuel change and support others through sharing my story and um, hope there's a better tomorrow for mothers and babies everywhere. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Black Maternal Health Week is in April. Um, Jessica and I have already talked. We're definitely gonna do more work. So you all can stay tuned for lots more um, information from us and just a definite call to action so that we can continue this fight. And the next slide is a slide on the left-hand side. If there is child loss that you know someone that has experienced, those are, I would say, my top three that I go to. And on the right-hand side, there are two organizations that are fighting for change as well on the mom side for moms that have passed away. The next slide is actually my family. <laughs> um, I'm thankful that this experience has brought us closer because I meet so many families that it's broken apart. Um, we always look to the middle of that picture to Kennedy to give us strength to keep us pushing because um, she's the reason that this was brought to our knowledge that this is an issue that's been experienced by so many families and we'll keep fighting for you, Kennedy. And I'd like to dedicate this to my beautiful Kennedy. <laughs> um, that's my daughter, that's Kennedy. Um, and just 
to, I, I always say she's the one that does the work, letting the angel babies up into heaven with her. And we as her parents are down here doing the work and fighting the good fight. So I thank you all for allowing me to speak, to share my story. I hope that you will continue to support my organization to support the Up Center and all of the organizations that have been able to speak today and share the message. I have a 5K that's coming up on October 16th for Pregnancy Infant Loss Awareness. You can go to my website. We're on all social media outlets to find out more, but please come out and support a great cause that affects so many. Thank you again. Good morning. I have the pleasure of introducing Rhonda McLean. She is with Tidewater Lactation Group where they aim to provide knowledgeable, compassion, and respectful support for all parents who choose to breastfeed their babies. They believe that every parent deserves the guidance and education they need to be empowered to nourish their child. Ron is a Hampton Roads native with 16 years experience in the early childhood field. Her passion for helping people brought her to Tidewater Lactation Group, where she started out as a customer service rep. They love her optimistic attitude and the moms are so appreciative for her gentle spirit. She has completed her LER, an online 90 hour lactation training program and is now a certified breastfeeding specialist. She also breastfeeds her daughter, Ronnie. I give you Miss Rhonda. Hello, ladies. Can everybody hear me okay? Hopefully you can. Um, had some audio issues this morning, um, but thank you for that introduction. Um, as she said, I am Rhonda McLean. I've been working with Tidewater Lactation Group for the better part of five years. Um, and I'm talking, coming to speak to you today about uh, breastfeeding. And we're going to talk about breastfeeding. Um, I am going to mention slightly about chest feeding. I don't really talk much about that, um, but that's part of um, what we do here. We haven't had a lot of people do that, but um, we still do have that. We're, uh, next slide, sorry. <laughs> I'm actually just a disclaimer, um, the pictures and the slides, because they are of real people. Um, we ask that, you know, don't use those without written permission, of course. Um, next slide. So uh, objective, objective today is um, just learning about breastfeeding and chest feeding and its benefits um, and becoming familiar with the resources and also learning about the different elements of breastfeeding, which is very important. A lot of people don't know about. Um, I will share um, my breastfeeding experience um, later on, but we are going to move forward. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, the definition, as you can see, uh, breastfeeding is of course feeding human milk uh, to a child, um, either directly by the breast or expressing the milk using a pump or hand expression or other methods. Chest feeding is exactly what it sounds like. It's chest feeding. For the LGBTQ community, they use that more than um, any others. They actually have devices that help them breastfeed and nurse. Um, we can move forward. Um, some of these benefits are not really uh, known. Some of them are. Um, there's a lot more benefits, especially when it comes to the black and brown community. Um, it lower risk of certain conditions of ear infections, asthma, obesity, um, type 1 diabetes. There are many different um, SIDS, uh, different respiratory diseases and allergies. Um, that's something that is not really being pushed in the communities. That's one of the adverse um, issues that we're working with or working against, I'm sorry. Um, next slide, please. Um, we're work also talking about the benefits for moms because it goes two ways. Um, it lowers the risk of high blood pressure, which is also one of the uh, blood, high blood pressure and any heart related diseases are high percentage amongst black and brown. Um, type 2 diabetes, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, believe it or not, it does save money, it helps you drop 
drop pregnancy weight um, and reduces stress by releasing oxytocin, which is the hormone that makes you happy. Um, and that another benefit I have not included in the slide is how it, it, it strengthens the bond between the mother and the baby. Um, and that's something that is not being discussed uh, enough in uh, the communities as well as the hospitals. Um, within hospitals, they are pushing a little bit more formula than breast milk, which um, is part of the reason why the percentage is not as high as it should be um, of all of the different races, black and brown are the lower percentage. I don't have those exact numbers up to date anyway, but I do know um, we are in the lower end of that um, percentage of those who breastfeed six months or more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think we move on to the next slide. Um, and a little bit about what breast milk um, goes through three different transitions. Um, part of what we do is educate moms about their breast milk. And of course, you do hear these words here and there. You talk about colostrum, transitional milk, and mature milk, and the differences between them. So we're going to discuss those a little bit. On to the next slide, please. Um, so you have a colostrum, which is that first stage that uh, starts when you're pregnant. Um, and it continues for the first few days, usually after birth. Um, which is very important for the baby. Um, it is rich with, of course, the protein, vitamins, minerals, and antibodies that are passed uh, to go to the baby. Um, it's usually thicker um, and yet more yellow in color. Um, a lot of women who have different um, medical conditions or um, birth, sorry, I'm losing my words already. Um, uh, who are going through different birth avenues, it, this affects the colostrum and the production of the milk, which is also something that is not being told. Um, you know, I've hear, heard these stories that you guys are talking in, and, and some of them are very common, unfortunately, um, especially for the mom uh, that has a cesarean section, which is C-section, um, which is pushed a lot in the black and brown community as well. They're quick to take the babies instead of letting things um, go their natural course, which again, I am also a very big advocate for the doula, um, which is, uh, you know, who will help uh, circumvent that. Um, as far as uh, having a C-section, sometimes that can delay it. Um, and it's something that's not being told to moms as far as if you have too much fluid, during your labor, if you labor for a long time, there are a lot of different factors that could affect it. And a lot of moms who even have the smallest interest in breastfeeding can become discouraged because it is not happening in the time that it should or that they feel like it should. Um, okay, moving on to the next. Um, and then you have the transitional milk, which um, usually happens directly after the colostrum. Um, it is more fatty. Um, and it has more calories to uh, help uh, bulk the baby up, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. And this is where we talk about the mature milk. Um, the mature milk is what you have for the duration of your uh, breastfeeding journey. Um, we have uh, two different types of mature milk, which is the four milk, which is um, the beginning of the nursing is usually thinner, as you can see in the picture on the left. Um, there, it's slightly more translucent, um, whereas the hind milk is more creamy and it's thicker. Um, that is what is towards the end, uh, middle to the end of the feeding. Um, there are different um, techniques that we use to help moms, especially babies who are having issues with gaining weight um, in their breastfed oh, and helping getting more of that hind milk into their feeding so that um, we can help them build that weight up. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can move on to the next. All right. The different ways of breastfeeding. Um, you have uh, nursing at the breast without tools or aids, um, pumping or bottle feeding, pumping and bottle feeding, um, nursing at the breast with, with aids. Um, cup feeding, hand expression and bottle feeding and syringe feeding. All of these are techniques that 
moms can use to give the baby milk. Um, a lot of them are unknown or not really practiced because sometimes they feel like it can't happen, especially cup feeding. That's something um, we do practice that a lot of women are unaware of, that yes, your infant can drink from a cup. It is possible. And no, you will not drown the baby. <laughs> um, okay, we can move on because I do have slides showing these. Okay, we're going to talk about breastfeeding at the breast, which is the most common. Um, and we do have the different positions. I just did pictures of uh, each position because saying it, not all women know what it is and how, what it looks like. The cradle position is the one that you see on the left. Um, and sometimes the baby is more cradled. Um, that is more of the common um, position that moms do use. Uh, they are, <clears throat> excuse me, it's easier for the mom to uh, nurse the baby as well as have a free hand to do other things that they need to do, whether it is to help get the milk along by breast massage or, you know, drink or things like that, because we do talk about uh, having that availability because mommies do always forget, as we all do as mothers, forget to take care of ourselves because that is super important. Um, you have the cross cradle, which is similar to the cradle, but you are using the opposite hand um, to hold the baby. And of course, this is a little bit more daunting as you are being more hands-on with feeding the baby. Um, laid back is actually one of my favorites. Uh, my baby loves it. I have a one-year-old, as you heard in my bio, um, and she likes all of the positions, but laid back is more comfortable for us. Um, as you can see, you can lay back and have a little bit more of an um, intimate uh, session with the baby. Uh, you know, uh, we have babies who uh, love to look at mom. That's the one of that. Um, a part of the bonding uh, that moms and babies do, um, and eye contact, and babies also help with that milk coming down, um, whether it be patting or, um, you know, touch within itself. Uh, breastfeeding is actually quite amazing where our bodies are talking to each other, mommy and baby, um, whether it's the baby telling the mom's body, hey, I would like more milk, and I have another let down, or um, if the baby's starting to catch uh, bugs or something like that, the um, antibodies that are passed through, um, the saliva of the baby touches mama's breast and the breast, in turn, you know, builds up the antibodies to push through the milk. So it's a quite amazing uh, situation. Next slide, please. And another is a side lane. This is what I used when I was, when um, my baby was very small. I did have a small baby. Um, and because I am a big breast woman, um, the sideline sometimes helps with the tiny babies and the big breasts. So you don't feel like you are smothering the baby. Um, the football and clutch is usually used for the smaller, or if you are nursing multiples, it is a more comfortable position. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are some of those tools that we talked about, or oh, that I mentioned a little bit uh, about. Uh, one of them is the supplemental nursing system, and that is where, you, as you can see, it has like a little container that has breast milk um, or formula. We have done both. It depends on the family's uh, preference and a tube that goes from that. And you tape it to your breast, and it actually sits on side of the nipple so that the baby's still getting that at the breast experience, and the mom is also receiving that. Um, these can be used for a number of reasons, but it is one of the tools that is absolutely available to moms. Uh, nipple shields are little silicone um, devices that we use on the nipple. If the baby is having issues with latching, um, we do have a certain oral conditions for babies that they are unable to latch on their own or move their tongue correctly or, you know, in, in a way that it's more effective at the breast. Um, and nipple shields are a great tool to use for that. Some women need it for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. Some people use it for the duration of the breastfeeding journey. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. 
uh, more uh, a, a, a syringe as uh, I had to use a little bit um, with my baby um, for different reasons, but it's exactly like it sounds. It's just a little syringe that you use to uh, extract the milk and put in the baby's mouth. Of course, we do a little at a time. Um, the nipple everter for those moms who have what we call flat nipples or nipples that are don't really have a button, um, there is an actual device that will help pull it out. And as well as uh, the nipple everter, you can also use a actual pump and um, pumping your milk will bring out that nipple. Um, and we have also suggested that to moms. Uh, cups, that's again, when I talked about the cup feeding um, for infants, again, multiple reasons as to why uh, that is a tool that works well for babies. Some babies do better with that. Um, and as you can see, it can start as little as a couple weeks. All right, next slide, please. I try not to throw a whole bunch of information at you. I read, I'm a very visual person and pictures do wonderful. Um, breastfeeding multiples is absolutely possible. I tried my best to find pictures that depict that. I really wanted to do uh, black and brown, um, which we are out here more than it used to be. Um, 10 years ago, breastfeeding wasn't a huge thing, but as the years have progressed, it's becoming become more and more common especially in the black and brown community. Um, as you can see, the woman on the left is nursing her twins um, and using that football hold that I said that is very common. Um, you can also do the cradle. Um, that's another picture. I don't think I made it, but it is. it looks awkward, but it does work. Uh, these things are possible, and I do wish that more black and brown understood that. Um, but we're working hard on that. Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, the picture that you see in the middle is kind of like is um, another mom with twins and a, uh, or triplets, actually, um, and how she is nursing with them. And, and they're absolutely possible. A lot of women think there's no way in the world that I can. But again, the human body is amazing and will make the milk that you need to provide for your baby. Um, next slide, please. And this is um, tandem nursing that we also encourage moms to do if they feel, because a lot of moms do feel shame, and this is definitely big in the black and brown community. I will give my own testimony to that. When I decided to do uh, breastfeeding, I was in this field already when I was pregnant. Um, but when I, you know, told my family that's what I wanted to do, and they're like, well, why would you want to do that? And oh, well. Um, it takes too much time, and there's no way you'll be able to do it. So it was a little bit of discouragement because I didn't have that support from my family, which is very important to have. I will say that on the flip side, I did have some who were very supportive, and I just wish our community was a little bit more informed and um, supportive of it. I have found my tribe, as you call, um, through different groups of moms who are black and brown and who are breastfeeding and who are very big advocates for it. Uh, tandem nursing is something that is that can be done if you are the mom who wants to breastfeed until your child decides not to, or if you have your children close together. If you have what we call stair step uh, children who are a year or less apart, um, or I'm sorry, <laughs> two or less, apart and you are nursing them at the same time, it is absolutely doable, um, as you can see in the pictures. And <laughs> the toddler that's on the top, that's currently my daughter's uh, position. <laughs> she loves that. Um, but anyway, she is um, a year. And I have seen moms who have nursed children three, four years old and just had a baby. Um, and on the other side of it, you do have it where the older child loses interest or just, you know, doesn't want to anymore, and that's okay. And a lot of these moms need to be told that it is okay, <laughs> you know, whichever your journey is. Uh, too much in the society do we have a lot of people who are shaming. And I will say there are people even in the lactation community who shame women who decide to use formula instead of um, breast milk. And it's whatever is your choice. 
um, breastfeed. There are many, many benefits to breastfeeding. But if you are that mom who have all type of medical conditions that actually prevents you from doing that, you should not be shamed for making that decision that works best for you and your baby. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and this is part of those advers adversaries. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, language. Um, issues that some breastfeeding women face, especially in the black and brown community. You know, the lack of family support that I talked about, uh, social pressures you do have, especially in the hospitals, um, although we are working very hard on trying to fix it, but some hospitals are still very formula, poor formula, and they push it. Like, as soon as you have the baby, they come with all these free things. Um, formula companies are very pushy, and they here are these free bags with all of these things, and how easy it is and how benefit it, you know, how much it benefits the baby and how close it is to uh, breast milk. Um, they use all the tactics and lots of them are not true. Um, you know, lack of support from your employer. Um, some employers are not supportive of a woman's decision to breastfeed, um, like supplying um, a space for them to pump or even time them to pump. That is actually quite common, unfortunately. Um, ah, very good. Um, sorry. Um, also, no access to uh, lactation resources. That is something, again, that is changing. Um, and COVID kind of helped push that along where it made it a little more accessible to moms who may not have had that access before uh, because there are virtual visits that are being covered now um, by different um, insurance companies, which is great for the moms who um, couldn't otherwise get that help that she needs. Um, and the medical conditions that make breastfeeding difficult, um, there are some out there, one of them being um, PCOS, which um, affects the mom's reproductive uh, system, which also uh, affects that milk production. Um, again, it could be lots of different reasons. Um, there are limited resources in certain areas, especially in the more urban. Um, again, we do have programs like WIC, Up Center, um, the health department that are pushing and helping these families who uh, would like to receive that support and help in breastfeeding and lactating. Um, and same thing with the local access to supplies. Only recently have we had more of an increase um, with a, um, access to breast pumps, which is another thing that can be expensive. You know, those moms can't necessarily afford a two, three hundred dollar pump. Um, I'm noticing more companies, especially since the Affordable Care Act has come forth with. Um, requiring that certain services be provided for all moms and lactation being one of them and uh, breast pumps, which is a great thing. Um, please. Okay, and here we have the different types of breastfeeding support. Um, in the picture is actually my mentor and boss. Elizabeth Flight, she is helping a mom with uh, positioning and things like that. We do have the IBCLC, which is what she is. It's the International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. It is almost the highest position you can get. It does require a lot of education um, as well as taking a an exam. You have to um, sit for the exam that they only offer twice a year. I'm actually on that path to become an IBCLC. Lord willing, I will have that next year. Um, you also have the certified lactation counselor, um, the certified lactation specialist, and the educator. All of these different um, positions have different education requirements, and that is the main difference between them. Um, but all of them are helpful. Uh, a lot of uh, WIC breastfeeding peer counselors are available that I'm just learning about, especially in our area in Hampton Roads. Um, and La Leche League is more um, virtual. They do have a lot of virtual help as well as different people who um, are available uh, to help you with any of the resources that you require. And next slide. 
it. Um, and this is part of what I talked about, the whole community support. Uh, you do have WIC uh, that's available in the different cities, 757 Breast Feeds, which is like the coalition for our area um, and Virginia Breastfeeding Coalition, uh, the La Leche League, a lot of these um, entities do have resources via their website, um, which I'm so sorry I did not provide all of them. Um, we do have uh, different um, different resources for moms who are seeking that help or would like to just have that education. Um, what we have seen are um, increase on uh, prenatal care uh, because that's a lot of what is needed. You know, they, these moms need that information before baby comes. Um, that is, you know, help them go on their path. And we talked about the birth plan and everything and having that set for um, a doula. Um, I do recommend people do seek that help in the lactation world, especially if you are nursing and you are either in pain. A lot of people feel like uh, it, it, it should, you know, it's pain is okay and that's something it shouldn't be. Um, if you do have that availability, being a professional would definitely help if for nothing else to have that reassurance, especially if you do not have that support at home and the knowledge that is constantly changing on um, lactation and latch and different things when it comes to the baby and the mom, you know, your home life, important thing ever is to um, take care of yourself. Don't forget yourself, um, because if you are not well, you cannot care for your baby. Um, I look forward to any of the questions you may have. My presentation was a little bit on the short side. I do apologize, um, but I welcome any of it, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you to all the presenters. Um, let's give them a hand. Thank you guys so much for um, your presentation. So at this time, we will now open the floor to any questions um, that you have for any of our presenters. And I know one, I did see one that was in the chat. It was for Heather. Um, someone wanted to know, where did you say they could get the information, the free information that you had shared? So it's starlegacy.com. And they have a Virginia chapter. So there is a chapter. It's they mostly meet on the Williamsburg side. I'm not sure where everyone is located or if everyone here is from Virginia. Um, if you're from another state, check the website to make sure um, because they are in most states and it's star legacy. Each one of their stars represents a piece of um, infant, infant loss that is either advocacy or it's research, they do a lot in the community. And as I mentioned, all of their brochures are free and they are in English and Spanish as of now. Another question, I know you answered it in the chat, but I want you to say it out loud for everybody. They wanted to know how can they um, support Kennedy's Angel Gown? So one way to support is come out to our 5K on October 16th. We do two big events. One is the 5K. That's always during Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, which is the month of October. Um, we also do an angel ball, which is a, a gala that we have, and that's in May for Bereaved Mother's Day. All of these events are for those who have lost children, but those who just want to support a great cause. So anyone is welcome to any of our events. You can follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, and you can also check out our website. If you go to our website right now, you'll find the 5K is the one that's um, the first thing that you'll see, it's www.kennedysangelgowns.org. And I will put that in the chat as well. Yes, and if everyone could, all the presenters could also um, put in their um, email addresses into the chat also. And so we have another question. Um, where do you find information regarding choosing a doula? And is also, is there ever too late? Is there ever a time that's too late for a doula? 
Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> There's never, it's never a time too late to, to choose a doula. As you can see um, from the presentation, there are um, doulas for all areas <laughs> from pregnancy to during labor and to after, um, after you give birth. So there is different, um, there's also different um, places. You can go to Donut International. Um, that's where I'm certified as a doula. Then they have a list of doulas that you can, um, that you can from in different states. So if nobody's in Virginia, there's there. Um, and then they have questions that you should ask your doula as well um, when you're interviewing. So you're probably gonna interview several doulas to make sure you find the one that best suits you, right? So there's different questions up there as well um, to help you out. Deb, another question. Um, what is the cost of doulas? Okay, so that, <clears throat> that ranges. Um, for me, my services are free. Um, there are also some certifying doulas that are also doing free services. Um, for those other doulas, they range from, from $500 to two grand. Thank you. Um, Rhonda, is there a way to reach brown and black women during prenatal appointments to promote the idea of breastfeeding? Um, the best way, um, you know, unfortunately, especially in the last year, um, and that's only because I have dealt with it myself, um, the prenatal appointments are very limited on who can go into the office. Um, you know, we do have certain uh, resources that are available to local doctors. We, we ourselves here at Tidewater Lactation Group has that have sent out many, um, you know, flyers and, um, excuse me, bookmarks uh, with our information and what we offer. Um, we do try to get that information out. Um, as things open up, I mean, right now there's no other way then to provide that. Unfortunately, when you go to these prenatal appointments, they are throwing mad paper at you and a lot of women don't sit and read. You know, they're not gonna go through all of that information. Yes, there may be some on the wall, there may be in different places, um, but you know, there, that, that's really not there. Uh, I mean, it's there, but they're not going to sit and read and get that information. Um, working, trying to work on ways on trying to get that information out. I know the WIC program works um, with moms who do sign up for it. They do have classes available. Um, same goes for social service. If you are uh, Medicaid, a mom, they do have resources listed for them. Um, and, but unfortunately, if you're not in that world, if you're not seeking it, it's, wow. it's one of those things that's hard to get to these moms. Thank you. Uh, Heather. What supports did you receive in 2009 to manage lactation following your loss? And what are you seeing around this now as you visit? Very good question. Um, Family. The support that I had was my mom, who literally handed me some cabbages to help me to dry up the milk. Um, when, my, when my baby passed away, my body was still reacting as if she was alive and it was doing what it was supposed to do. And so that was another harsh reality is when my milk did come in. My milk came in about um, two days after I came home. Um, what I'm seeing now is so good. Um, I try to have them at all of my events because what you can now do is you can donate your milk to um, family. So you can donate your milk. And one thing about um, the program that we have here in Hampton Roads is they give you a necklace with your baby's milk in it after you do the donation. And it just, it blesses my heart that, that they have something um, that families can, can do and women can feel good about helping another child, but also have a piece of their baby. And did That's you beautiful. get any education about that at the hospital? I did not. I got, um, in fact, my experience was horrible. I got wheeled down next to a mom who was holding her live baby. Um, I, my experience, I was told mm -hmm. once when um, I needed some assistance after my birth, um, hold on, I'm working with another mom. Her baby needs mm -hmm. me right now. I got, I mean, it was not yeah, like all the wrong things. Yeah, it was all the wrong things. I, um, I often sit on panels at hospital, hospitals to share what not to say because some of the very basic mm -hmm. things they said to me were just so hard during a time mm -hmm. that I was already feeling beat up. Mm -hmm. 
So it's come a long way. That it, the good news is it's come a long way. We still have a ways to go, mm -hmm. but from 2009 to now, I can say that there's a lot more support and resources available. Mm -hmm. That was the next question. So is that still happening in your experience and are families receiving lactation education now after loss? Yeah, there's still a lot of things that I do have to step in. Um, I can say right before COVID, there was a, a nurse who referred to the mom was trying to get information of how she could get her baby to the funeral home. And she said they will pick it up soon and referred to her baby as an it. So I went right up to the nurse's front desk office and um, had a couple words because never will in my presence anybody's baby be a full term baby as an it. So um, there's yeah. still there's there's still a lot of knowledge that's lacking, um, but I still I see strides. I don't feel like it's um, as terrible as it once was. There are people that really do care, and sometimes it's just they don't know any better. So um, that's all of us on this, on this presentation, on this call. That's our job to really educate and make sure that people know what to say, what not to say, and how to be supportive and caring. Deb, are hospitals, doctors, nurses accommodating to doulas when they are present for delivery? Um, I get mixed feelings about this. Some doctors are. Um, some are not, <laughs> some are not, um, but more of the doctors who um, are more on the holistic side and are, are trying to work with their mothers and their birth plans are more accommodating to, um, to doulas who are just strictly science. This is by the book there, like this is what it is, you need to move out of the way um, and let me do my job kind of thing. So you kind of see it more so like they are starting to be a little bit more common since you know, this whole topic is, you know, becoming to the forefront and people are starting to move to home births and move to birth center births and working with midwives now. Um, they're starting to, it's like, okay, the doula is coming in the room like, oh, you're talking to your doula. Okay, fine. Let's see what we can do to work together. Um, question. Are there any baby-friendly hospitals in Hampton Roads? Since Princess Anne is a baby-friendly hospital, <laughs> I do know that one for a fact. Yes. Okay. I would say um, the messaging throughout the, the Sentara hospitals I can speak for because they do do trainings and I've sat in their trainings and um, they're, they don't just say we're going to do better. They show up to my events. It's imagine um, seeing one of the nurses that help you deliver your baby come to an event that supports you as you remember your baby. So I can say um, that definitely the, the Centeras are baby friendly. They've sure. um, donated they've had we've had walls with the baby's names on it they are like reaching out and saying what can we do as nurses this isn't just a job for me kind of situations Sentara princess Anne also has a doula program that i used to volunteer on where they have actual doulas that volunteer their time on the floor to assist laboring moms and their families too so there's also that option um Deb, do you provide doula services in newport news yes i provide doula services for all of hampton roads Can they just email you, Deb? Yes, they can. Okay. Do. okay. Um, here's many moms that we work with want to breastfeed, but begin formula feeding really early on because they feel like they are not producing enough milk. And it doesn't seem like they are being supported by their medical providers to continue breastfeeding. How can we? best support these moms, Rhonda? Um, okay, well, first I'm gonna say, yes, that is very common. Uh, medical providers, um, some are not as supportive in breastfeeding as others. Um, some of it has to do with time, um, but the best way that we can support them is support them, I apologize, is to um, get that information out because that's the biggest thing a lot of moms don't know like the, you know if moms start formula feeding a lot of moms don't understand that there is a such thing as relactating even though you started with formula we can start the process and going back and, and breastfeeding that is possible um you know trying to get that message out there especially in our communities um that you know lack that 
um, you know, the different events, the different forums that we're having and gets it out there, you know, when they go to their doctor's appointments, you know, talking with these doctors saying, hey, here's some information. If you ever have a mom that, you know, has questions about lactation, you know, here are a list of resources in different cities. You know, I know with the coalitions, we're working on putting that information together so that it's more accessible to moms in different parts of as far as if they're in Newport News and, you know, their doctor only has information about uh, lactation services in Virginia Beach, for instance, you know, it, it has that that information for them, you know, different hotlines that can be called if you're having any issues, you know, I feel like that information needs to be pushed. Um, it's hard, especially now with COVID, like I said before, getting to doctor's office like before is not the same. Um, it doesn't look the same, but we are trying our hardest to get it out there to get the information to as many offices as we possibly can. Okay, I see you guys are answering some questions in the chat too. Thank you. Um, here's another one. Is there a strong midwife presence in Hampton Roads? Are doulas now more prevalent or are they seen as competing with midwives? Um, doulas and midwives are not the same. <laughs> we are trained professionals and so midwives are, well, they're different types. Okay. Let me take a step back. There are different types of midwives. You have your certified professional midwives, you have your certified midwives and your um, certified nurse midwives. Um, your certified midwives and your certified professional midwives, I'm sorry, it's a lot to say in one. In one they, they are trained, they are professional um, trained, but they are not medically trained. Like they passed the state test, but they did not go to school to be a nurse. So they are very hands-off work. They're just gonna make sure that, um, that not you know that pair of eyes that nothing's happening and you know so if something does you do need to have to transfer to the hospital they're there for that nurse midwives um are the ones that went to school and all the training um for that so they are not the same as doulas they're they're they're, they're not competing there are um a heavier presence of them as far as women of color um there's not too many nurse midwives of color <laughs> that i've noticed around the area mm -hmm. however they are they are out there. So if you do want their information, I do have <laughs> their information. Um, Heather, does a family have to request the butterfly, butterfly suite if they are expecting a loss, an infant loss? It's kind of protocol at this point um, that they know that that space is there. The nurses and doctors are aware of it. They actually have gotten some letters from the nurses and doctors and they find that room so peaceful that they even utilize that room as a quiet space when they need to just calm their spirit after witnessing uh, a tragic loss. So it is um, a room that's used by staff, that's used by families, and they will know to bring them right to that room. The issue becomes it's only one room. And so there's um, Norfolk General has an average of 25 stillbirths a month. So there's a good chance that the room is already being utilized, mm -hmm. in which um, case we have donated two additional cooling units there. So there's three units so that if a family is already in the room, there is also um, other devices they can use. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. I do want to um, mention, I did answer the question in the chat um, about the birth center. The birth center in Newport News is called the Village Midwife. Um, there is one stand, that's the only standalone um, birth center as of right now in Hampton Roads. Correct me. Thank you. <laughs> There's one more question. Um, it says, I've seen billboards in Portsmouth promoting breastfeeding. How can we get more to normalize and promote breastfeeding? I feel like that can work in many different ways. If you, um, it, in a close circle, if you know of anybody who is breastfeeding, encourage them, be that support. You know, it, it could be something as simple as, you know, your friend is breastfeeding and, um, you know, maybe she's struggling in the beginning. You can offer to do things around the house to help take the pressure off of her so that she feels less stressed. Um, and one of the other things is if you see someone in public, not everybody wants to be <laughs> put on the spot, but, you know, a smile, a kind word, because that's where it, you know, the biggest issue is being out in public and, you know, nursing your baby and it's something that you're doing and getting the looks. Um, I myself have experienced that. 
It's something that society has frowned upon, even though in the state of Virginia, you can breastfeed anywhere. Nobody can tell you to leave or go in the bathroom. That is not okay. Um, You know, encourage that mom. I've even gone so far to say, you know what? You're doing great. You are doing amazing. Thank you for doing what you do. You know, that little bit of encouragement from a total stranger can help. And, you know, the more that we do that and the more people do that, the less it will become taboo and, you know, become an issue for moms to practice. Maybe they'll feel like, you know what, what I'm doing is not so bad. It's not so strange. Right. I have to read this. So um, Ms. Jereen Fleming just said, normalization, try to talk to pregnant people about your own positive experiences about breastfeeding. So that is. Absolutely. I agree. Um, Are there any trainings or certifications that you all will recommend for us professionals who are not medically trained, but passionate about maternal health? Oh, there are many. I I um I know uh, uh, the course that I took was LER. I did not start in the medical field. I actually am coming from an early childhood background. It has nothing to do with medical. Um, when it comes to you know breastfeeding and helping, that I went to LER's website. They had classes available and trainings that you can do. The health department is always putting on different things as well. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, Those are some great questions. Leslie said, holistic community support is healing and can be life-saving. So thank you guys so much for um, coming to talk about, you know, like we said before, a hard conversation, something that a lot of people don't really want to talk about um, and the stigmas around it. Um, Deb said, trauma-informed care training, definitely. Um, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that the VDH sponsors trainings for Virginia providers, and there's a site in the chat. Also. Mm-hmm. I'm also going to post our survey in the chat. If you could please participate in the survey. Um, we hope that you guys uh, receive some valuable information on today. The presenters' emails are also in the chat. So definitely reach out to them if you have any more questions. And thank you all once again. So everyone have a great Wednesday and be on the lookout for more um, events to come. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Take care. Thank you.